Good evening, Franklin Club. Give everyone a minute or two to tune in here, but uh, this should be a fun one. We're going to follow up on uh, last week's theme of some steelhead flies, and this week we're going to be doing, uh, instead of some swung steelhead flies, we're going to be doing some nymph patterns. Um, so these are really great year-round flies. Uh, I think cover your bases pretty well. I uh, shouldn't need, well, you definitely could use more on this, but uh, this would easily fill a box nicely for you and, uh, and get you fishing well. So um, yeah, whether you're fishing fall, winter, spring, whatever it is, these these should work well for you. Uh, see, we've got one or two already tuned in here. Cool. So yeah, we can kind of hop into it. So the idea here is to kind of cover a few different bases in terms of food sources for you. So when we're talking about steelhead, the most readily available food sources for them are the ones found uh, throughout the colder months of the year. So um, eggs um, are, are probably the most prominent uh, food source through the fall, early winter months, and again in the spring, uh, basically when any fish, whether it be salmon, steelhead, suckers, are spawning. Uh, stoneflies, which are present year-round and quite active, and they get uh, dislodged from rocks all the time, and they're also a pretty hardy large food source for these fish. Um, they really come into their own. We're looking at uh, early winter uh, right through until spring. They will work any time, but um, fish, when, when given the opportunity, typically key in uh, pretty well into egg flies. And then as those eggs become less and less prominent in the rivers, um, sort of as they settle into the, the river bottom, uh, get covered up by, by the fish or just eaten, um, then, uh, then the other food sources become a little bit more key in a fish's diet. So stoneflies are sort of your early winter, you know, and, and onwards um, food source. Worms seem to work any time. Uh, you definitely get more worms present this time of year, uh, and so it's definitely a favorite spring fly, but for whatever reason, they just work, uh, whether it's, you know, through the fall, winter, or spring there. And then I'm gonna tie up caddis here today too. Uh, caddis are present year round in the, the rivers, so you could definitely catch on any time, but similar kind of thing to the, um, the stoneflies as um, you know, eggs become less available to fish, you'll start getting a little bit more action on the, um, on other nymphs like caddis and mayflies, although they do typically, you know, become a little bit more active and we're going to be tying a caddis pupa here. So, um, something a little bit later on, not a, a larva. Um, so this will be, you know, as water temperatures warm up, move into the spring, it tends to be a little bit more effective, but I've definitely caught fish on it right through the winter, uh, despite cold temperatures. So, uh, that's kind of where we're looking. We're going to do four flies. We advertised three in the description, but I uh, thought that we could probably squeeze in a fourth there for the hour. So without rambling too much more, I'll hop in here as a reminder. Um, I do have, uh, a sight line on the chat here. So if people have questions as we go along here, feel free to drop any questions in that chat and I will get back to them as we go. All right, with that, let's jump over. So I'm gonna tease you with this one. This is the caddis pupa that we're gonna tie, this little fly here. Um, but it's actually not what we're going to start with. We're gonna start with something really easy for everybody to try out and something that works anytime, which is an egg fly. I don't have a demo on me here, but this is a stupid quick one, so we'll have a demo quick enough for you. So hook wise, I like to tie mine on a jig. You certainly don't have to. You can tie it on a straight egg hook, whatever you like. This one here, this is a Hannock 450, size 12, is your favorite. But something decently big. This pattern ends up being fairly chunky in its own right, and so a small hook doesn't really do you any favors. Uh, the fly is almost a preset size anyways, uh, unless you want to trim it down, which you certainly could, but I think you know, no need to go too, too small on this as uh, the smaller you go, the lower your hookup percentage is going to be. So again, you could tie this on non-jig hook, but the jig hook, you know, it inverts the fly, you'll hang up on bottom a little less. Um, that is my preference. And there's lots of traditional, you know, glow bugs and stuff that you can tie, but this is a cool one that's uh, really easy to tie, that we're, we're going to use a, a newer material that's been very popular and very effective for us. Uh, for thread, this is a pretty thin one, this is a 14 knot, but you could easily and probably should do it with something heavier, uh, but a red. I like a red for my, my egg flies. I think that provides a nice little hot spot, almost like a blood spot toward the, uh, the front of it. And this bead on here, just because we're tying on a uh, jig hook, this is a slotted bead, just so it wraps around the elbow of that hook eye uh, a little better there. 
Uh, if you're tying this on a straight nymph hook, you could use the slotted bead, or uh, you could definitely just uh, use a, a regular countersunk bead. You could also tie this without a bead at all. Uh, however, the bead limits the need for any kind of split shot, and any time that we can limit the use of split shot is to our advantage. It'll keep a, a tighter connection between your fly and you. Um, so all I'm doing here, just to kind of lock the bead in, is build up a few thread wraps just behind the bead. You can snip off the excess here. And this is a one material fly, if you don't count the thread, hook, and bead. And so what we're gonna use, this is uh, Eggstasy. It's from a company called Flybox. And this is made, if anyone's um, tied blobs to fish at the club before, same company that makes Fritz, or a very popular one that make fr makes Fritz. There are a number of brands out there. But uh, this one is specifically for eggs. It works really well, actually. Its original design was to be fished in lakes. Uh, egg flies do work really well in lakes. And this, uh, if you want to tie this exact same fly and just put under a bung or fish static, fish a uh, very slow retrieve, essentially fishing the drop in the ponds at the club, this works really, really well. Um, but thinking of it as an egg today, it's basically just a chenille with sort of like an egg yarn type material strung between it. This color doesn't come through super well here. This is a, just a light pink. Uh, comes in a number of different shades. I really like the paler colors, especially getting into the spring here. You find that eggs tend to be those lighter shades. Um, all I've done is just clipped a, a little piece. This will probably get me a few flies. And as with a lot of chenilles, what we like to do is just take the end and pull off some of the fluff on the end just to expose those thread cores there. And I'll just catch that in behind the bead. I'm, you'll notice I'm not tying very far back on this fly. I'm just tying back to maybe the halfway and that's why you want to use a heavier thread than my 14 out here. <laughs> this was just the only red thread I had kicking around. Being sloppy. I see there's a few more people who have checked in. For those of you who are just checking in, if you have questions as we go, just drop them in the chat and I will get back to them. All right, back on track. No need to fret about that. I haven't gotten much of anywhere yet. So, backtrack a little bit. Grab our eggs to see chenille here. I'll just catch that in. Tie down, again, about halfway down the shank. Don't need to go all that far back because that material is going to hang back pretty far anyways. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, I'm going to start wrapping it. You can treat it kind of like a hackle just to get the, um, the most volume out of it is you can sort of pull the fibers back as you wrap. This is how I like to wrap Fritz as well. And I'm not looking at packing these wraps in too tight. I just wanna make two or three wraps forward to the bead here, like so. You'll see it creates this nice little egg shape. Cross it off, done. There's a little tag and thread hanging out the butt there. Snip off the excess here. Oops, there we go. And then what you can do if you want, you can just tie it off there or you can build up a little bit of a collar there of red. Again, just if you want that blood spot kind of look on the egg, that's a nice look, I think. I'll just throw on a quick whip finish and that's it. Like I say, this is a super, super simple egg fly. You can tie it without the bead. Uh, you can tie it on a regular hook. It doesn't have to be a jig hook by any means there. Uh, but really, really effective. This stuff tends to be a little softer than regular egg yarn, I find. It has a little bit more motion um, on a very small scale uh, and a little more translucency than, say, a McFly foam or something like that. So I'm a big, big fan of this. You can see how quick it is to bash out. I don't need to trim it to shape or anything like that. It's just set it and forget it. Uh, in terms of bead size here, this is a three mil bead. If I was running this under an indicator or especially in a multi-fly rig like you might fish sometimes, um, I think a three mil is plenty. But if you are going to, say, tight line it, um, or you're just going to fish it by itself, you might want to bump up the bead size a little bit because this material does catch a lot of water and it can slow its descent down a bit. So, you know, bumping it up to a three and a half, even maybe up to a four mil for really high water, um, perfectly reasonable, I think. Uh, but give it a shot as your eggs to sea egg. It does not get much similar. Again, feel free to fish it just in the, the ponds. It is a really good fly at the Franklin Club in the ponds. Um, speaking of colors a little bit, you know, relaying it back to the fishing. So like I say, egg flies, 
they work kind of year round, but especially when there are more eggs present in the systems. So again, that's your fall months when you have salmon and, sorry, I shouldn't say steelhead because they are mainly a spring spawning fish, but salmon spawning and dropping eggs. And then again in the spring when you have steelhead and, uh, and suckers dropping eggs. Um, what you're generally looking at is bolder colors when the eggs are fresh, when they're just spawning. And past that, so you think salmon spawn mostly in October, maybe a little in November. When the eggs get dropped from the fish, they're quite a, a bright orange uh, a lot of the time. And then the longer they're in the river, they sort of milk out. They, the, you know, if they aren't fertilized and they're dead eggs, um, they lose a lot of their color. You know, all the, the nutrients and stuff that were in them making them such a, a bright orange. They, they just sort of lose a lot of their color. And so you'll find a lot more of these sort of light pinks and peaches and even white going into, uh, into the early winter months can be really, really good. In the spring, uh, trout eggs are a little lighter usually as well as suckers. So, you know, light yellows, light pinks, things like that. Orange can definitely work. Um, and again, getting lighter and lighter shades as we go on. Not so much the whites, I wouldn't say in the spring because by the time that we get to that point in the season, the steelhead have mostly dropped out of the rivers. Uh, they're, they've done their business. It's their own eggs that are getting old by that point, so the fish are long gone. But yeah, generally light pinks, light yellows in the spring, that's my, my preference there. And that's, that's about all there is to them. On to the next, unless again, there are any questions and anyone wants to drop them in the chat. What do we have next here? All right, let's do, let's do the worm. The next simplest and next deadliest, if not the deadliest. So this one, there's lots of different worms out there. Um, they're all kind of similar in, in shape. There's not a lot you can do with a worm other than alter the material, as you'll see that we're going to do. I'm just gonna grab a hook and a bead here. So this is another one. You know, the fly itself is going to be relatively large or sort of a predetermined size. And so I don't think there's any harm and think, in fact, I think there's only benefit to going with a larger hook. So this is a size eight nymph hook. This is, it's a pretty big hook. You could tie tens, eights in around there, but again, I don't see any value in going smaller because the fly is going to be, you know, yay big or so. Uh, I think I do have maybe a sample of one kicking around. Yes, yeah, this is a different color than we're gonna tie. This is kind of what we're shooting for. So you can see, I mean, we've got lots of overhang here. This is a big fly. Going down in hook size doesn't really alter the fly size at all. And it just means that we have a smaller point and gap to actually get connected on the fish with. So you might as well go with something relatively decent size. Worth noting, I do tie these for the shop. If you're not a fly tire, uh, we've got lots. <laughs> um, cool, so looking at this, I've got size eight nymph hook. Again, you could tie this on a jig hook. I actually prefer the regular nymph hook because I just find it sits nicer uh, when it's all said and done. So for steelhead, I just use a straight nymph hook myself. This is a 5 30 seconds of an inch. Uh, this is just a brass bead. Uh, I'm tying this with the intention of fishing under an indicator. But if you're going to your nymph fit or tight line nymph fit, again, feel free to go tungsten for sure. For thread, this is the different part. Um, so this is a glow bright floss. This isn't actually a thread. You're welcome to tie this with thread, but this is a little trick. I picked up a little while back from Colin Huff, actually, um, Team Canada member. He's done some sessions at the club. Some of you may know him. Um, but really, really good hack to tying this fly. Makes it a lot easier. Globrite floss, this is mainly used, it's, it's a floss material. It's used for bodies and ribs and things, but it works really well as a thread for this. So actually, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Before we jump into that, we're going to weight this a little bit and use that weight to lock in the bead a little. So I've got, this is some lead wire. It's 0.025 inch lead wire. I'm just going to make just a couple of wraps behind three or four wraps there and then I'll just wind that wire, break it off. And I'll do the same thing up here. So we just got a few wraps of wire, push it forward back into the bead. You can see how that's going to secure our bead. From here though, take that bead and just push it back a little bit and carrying with it that lead wire. So I've just pushed it back, you know, a millimeter or two from the eye. And that's an important step. You'll want to do that. I'm then going to actually start my thread in front of the bead here. Like so. Which looks a little funny. It'll come into place in a second. With that, oops. <laughs> 
I'm on a roll tonight. Why am I a pro again? I don't know. All right. So cover a couple millimeters of space with your floss there. Push this back up to the start of your thread. So you've now kind of reserved that space for tying in front of the bead. I'm then going to bring my thread over the bead here. Again, looks a little funny. You may have to kind of hold this thread as you do it. That's fine. So I've just hopped right over the bead. You can see it looks hideous, doesn't look good at all. Again, it's going to come together. I'm then going to bring my thread back up to the back of the bead, covering up some of those lead wraps, just locking everything in. And I'll just go back over the bead once, a couple wraps in front, and over once again, so we end up behind the bead here. So I've just gone over the bead a couple times, made sort of an X wrap on top. And then I just want to sort of build up a little bit of a taper so I ramp up to this lead. I don't want this steep drop off off the back of the lead. I want a smooth transition between the shank and that wire. So I'll just take a few wraps back here. The floss is pretty thick, which is nice. So it builds up pretty quickly. Like so. So I've got a nice smooth base like that. Now the material, so this is going to be the infamous squirmy worm. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with it. This is just how I like to tie it. Uh, we can show it a million times. It is still just as effective as the first time you saw it. Again, it works really well at the ponds. Um, that's pretty well all these flies will. Uh, if you haven't seen this stuff before, it's, it's a silicone leg material. I uh, used to be able to get like little sort of stress balls um, at dollar stores with this stuff. It's impossible to find now. But this is the material. It's actually much easier now because you can get in long lengths. Um, usually it'll come in a little hank or a little preset length like this. What I usually find is that I, half the length of the hank works well. So I just cut it right in half. I can make two worms out of each strand, like so. And then how big you want to tie these is somewhat up to you. You don't need to go crazy with it, but you know, I like a, a worm that's a few inches long here, at least. So hang it off the back. This is where the floss comes in really, really handy. Pull off the back, make a very loose wrap off the back, come back up, and then tighten down. And the great thing about the floss is two things. One, it's pretty thick, and so it doesn't like to cut through this material. This material is so, so soft that traditional threads generally cut through it, which is kind of annoying. And then the other thing is that this thread, because of how wide it is and how soft it is, has a lot of grip. And so it doesn't like to twist on the hook too much. This tends to lock it into place very, very effectively. Uh, otherwise, again, with traditional threads, it likes to roll on you. So I'll get a second wrap on there. It ha has actually rolled on me just a tiny bit, if you can see that off to the side. So what I'll do, I haven't really locked down my thread yet. I've just made semi-tight wraps. I'll pull it back to the top of the fly. And then what I like to do is just gently pull back this material, stretch it out a little bit, and make a couple of wraps directly in front really tight to that material. And what that does is it sort of overlaps the previous wraps there and pinches the, uh, the squirmy material between the wraps out. That's a good trick, frankly, for any uh, material you're trying to lock in on any fly, is make a couple wraps behind and a couple really tight just in front, uh, tight being close, not physically uh, pulling tight necessarily. And with that locked in, I'm just going to take my thread or my floss back up to the back of the bead. And then what I'm going to do, the forward facing leg here, I've got the one off the back, one off the front. I'm going to take that and I'm going to start wrapping it with just a little bit of tension. Don't want to wrap this too hard because you can damage the material. I'm going to get up to the bead here. So we've just made sort of touching, slightly over wrap, overlapping wraps. And I'll put one or two more wraps right at the front here and that kind of pushes the wraps back and covers up your tie-in point and everything. Just makes for a really nice clean look. I'll get back to the top. So I want to tie this in at the same point where those X wraps over the bead were. Bring that to the top, catch that in. Again, it doesn't take a really tight wrap, just taut. I'll tie that on top. I'll then pull this leg back, make a wrap in front. And again, I'm just going over the bead head here like so, to the front, put a few wraps in there so it doesn't move around on you. So again, I've got those exposed wraps on top like that. I don't want those. So now I'm going to do just like a shell back on a nymph. I pull this worm material forward toward the eye and catch that in there. I will fully admit I ripped off this tying style from Devin Olson. I think he has the best way of tying it. 
And so this is why we tie this uh, in front, is because if we, if we tied this in off the back, it would kick up in the air, which looks just kind of weird. I'm sure it fishes fine. But doing it this way, folding it over, you get a nice sort of straight profile in the end when it's all said and done. And it just, I think it looks the best. So with that tied down, whip finish over top, done. Now, what I like to do, you don't want to use head cement or super glue on this because silicone, like many plastic-based materials, it'll melt with the application of those glues. Um, such a soft material to begin with, it'll fall apart pretty quickly if you use that kind of stuff. So what I do, I like to use a little bit of UV glue, UV resin like this stuff, uh, Solar Res, Loon, whichever brand you like. Um, I find, personally at least, it doesn't damage the material. There are some, most UV resins tend to heat up a little bit when you cure them, um, some more than others, so there, there could very well be brands that damage the material out there. Um, and even though I haven't had issue with this one, I try to just apply it to the thread wraps on the underside here. I try not to get onto the material itself, just enough that the thread wraps aren't gonna come undone. A little drop of that and hit it with the UV light here. You could skip the glue entirely if you don't have UV resin, you don't want to grab some. That's perfectly fine. Um, I would just recommend doing a double whip finish at the very least then, just to make sure things aren't going to come undone, because again, you don't want to use any other type of adhesive on it. And that's your squirmy worm. Uh, like I said, really, really good worm fly, whether it's for resident trout, for steelhead, for bass, uh, and certainly at the club as well. Really, really good fly. You can also tie it uh, just the single you know, length off the back, that works perfectly fine. In that case, doing the jig hook makes sense because it won't obstruct this front facing leg that's going to kick it up out of the way. Um, I like that one a lot for lower water situations. Um, but for, for most of my fishing, this style works really well. If I'm fishing a worm, it's generally in higher water. Worms, unlike the, um, the eggs, I'm not as picky about color. I mean, I am picky about color, but it doesn't change as much with the seasons or to match, quote unquote, the hatch. Uh, if you want to call eggs matching a hatch. Um, pink is generally the best color for steelhead. If I'm going to start with a fly, it's going to be pink, with a worm fly, that is. Um, but other colors that you'd want to stock, red for sure, and tan are really good when the water's a little clearer or the fish have seen a lot of pink. A lot of people do fish pink worms. So coming in, especially if the water's down and clear with something just a little different can really pay off sometimes. So uh, this is get, always gonna be my number one, but uh, red and tan, they can definitely have their day out there. All right, motoring through these things. What should we do next? Let's do the caddis next. So that's the one that we started the stream with in the vise. This is getting into a little bit more of a funky kind of fly. Uh, this fly is called the bird of prey. Uh, it's not a new fly by any means. It's, I've seen this thing for, for ages out there in every fly shop's box. It's a, it's a really fishy fly, I think. It's a caddis pupa. So it's got that kind of buggy, scruffy, leggy look with, if you can see, just a little bit of pearl shine through the body back here. Um, so I don't know that this only imitates a caddis. I think it could very well imitate a big mayfly or something as well, depending on the colors they tie it in. You could add some rubber legs to this. It would, uh, it would pass for a stone fly, no problem with some rubber legs. Um, feel free to tie in different colors. So the olives can have a nice uh, caddis option. You could tie in just a natural uh, sort of hair's ear color or a brown or an orange, anything like that I think works well. It's usually tied in pretty small sizes, and while you can definitely fish small sizes for steelhead, a lot of the time, you know, we're on bigger water, um, and these fish are looking for a, you know, a big calorie um, input from a, a snack. So tying in bigger sizes, I don't think is a bad thing. This is on the upper side of what I would tie it on. This is an eight. Uh, you could tie this 10, 12, 14, even 16, especially for your spring fishing when downsizing can really be key in really clear water. So the fly's tied on a curved nymph hook. I don't know how key the, um, the hook is and the shape of the, the hook is. I think it looks good with this fly, but I'm sure it would work just fine tied on a straight nymph hook as well. Uh, so pop this out of here. Grab a hook. This is going to be the same bead head that I tied the squirmy with. So this is a 5 30 seconds of an inch, um, just brass bead again. You gotta be careful selecting your beads and hooks here. Um, a lot of curved hooks, because they have this really 
tight turn at the back of them. They don't accept beads very well. Sometimes they don't fit well at all, if, if at all. Um, this one accepts a five three seconds bead, no problem. So I'm confident on that, but you gotta be careful about what you're buying. Uh, for the wire, I'm gonna use the same wire just to lock this bead in that I used for the previous uh, worms. This is just an 025 lead wire. You could use a lead free wire, no problem. And we'll make again, four wraps or so at the back here. And again, just winding this wire, to stress it and break it off. Like so. Jam that up into the bead. This is going to be more of a traditional nymph, so we're not spacing any beads out or tying in front of the bead or anything weird like that this time. Just using that lid to really secure the bead in place. Now for thread, this is just a dark brown thread, just something to roughly match the color of the body. I think this is a 10 knot, something, you know, not too large would be a good idea. And so I'm starting my thread just behind the wire here. Uh, for lead wire, I really like to get some wraps um, into the wire to really lock it in so it doesn't slide around on me and make sure my thread wraps aren't disappearing between the lead wire wraps. So throw a few wraps of thread over there, I'm just trying to fill in the, the gaps between the lead wire a little bit. Something like that. It doesn't have to be perfectly covered up. Snip off our tag. And now similar to the, um, the worm, again, I'm just going to try and build up uh, behind the wire here a little bit, smooth out the transition from my hook shank to that lead wire. A thicker thread admittedly would make this a faster process, but I'll try and be speedy about it here. Again, if you guys have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we can answer those as we go, even if they're not tying related, if they're just fishing related questions, happy to address them. So I've taken, I've smoothed that out. I've brought my thread back pretty far down around the bend, you'll see. So if my thread's hanging off the back, it's more or less in line with where the barb of the hook is here, or if it's a barbless hook, then just where the barb would be. Uh, so not way down around the bend, but a little ways down, just so we can take advantage of this curvature of the hook and give our fly a nice kind of shape. For the tail on this, we're going to use some partridge hackle. I thought I had a feather here, but I guess not. So I'll pluck another. If you don't have one of these, these make the whole tying of partridge game a lot easier. So this is a, you can't really see it in focus there. This is a whole skin I have here. And so I get a really nice range of feathers all the way from really nice small wet fly hackles here up to some darker hackles and some larger ones in the the rump here. Um, you can get the loose bags of partridge, but if you can get your hands on skin, it just makes the whole thing a lot easier and you get way more material. Um, it's just easier to keep track of what sizes you're getting. So I'm going to pluck out, I like a little bit of a darker, you know, more um, uh, pronounced barring on my, my hackles. So I'm going back, if this is the head of the bird here, I'm going back between the wings here to this darker stuff here. And I'm just going to pluck out a feather off the skin. That one looks as good as any. You don't need a giant feather for this. I've plucked out a feather from your bird or from just a, a loose bag of these things. And I'm just going to strip off, so I'm just going to pull against the grain, stripping off this fluff here. So I'm just left with my hackle, the nicely barred stuff up top. Now I'm going to grab for the tail a pretty good amount of fibers. So almost the entire side of this one hackle. I'm just going to kind of align the tips more or less by pulling them off the side, pulling them off at a 90 degree angle. Here's the tips all line up. And then with one motion, I'll just pull, oops, I'll pull the tip off. And then I'll pull against the grain of the feather to strip off a nice little bunch like so. Now for length, it doesn't need to be super long. Um, cast people don't have really long noticeable tails or anything. So this is just for a little motion. I would go for about half the length of the shank, inclusive of the bead. And I'm just going to roughly measure that up off the back, throw on a loose wrap and tighten down. So I've got, you can see that tail facing pretty, not straight down, but a, a healthy angle downwards here, like so. Now we're going to tie in the rib. You could use a wire for this. You could use even uh, one thing you could play around with if you wanted to use 
say something like a floss for a really bold rib, you could. What I've got here, this is just a little pearl tinsel. I'm getting kind of low here. I use a lot of this stuff. Really great material to have, but just a small translucent pearl tinsel. I'll take off a couple of inches of that and just tie that in on the side. Like so. And wind back. Gonna tie that all the way down here toward the tail. Right to the back of the body. Okay. We're gonna leave that for a second. Getting into the body. Uh, this is the material that I use. You can use any kind of hairs ear based dubbing. But this is a, um, a squirrel blend. It has a bunch of different types of hairs and uh, some synthetic antron in there too for a little sheen. Um, it's a nice kind of buggy dubbing, short fibered, easy to work with, really nice and soft. Um, it does have some natural kind of sheen to it, which is really nice. So this is an olive. Again, you could tie this in lots of different colors. I'm just going to take a pinch. And with caddis, caddis are typically quite scruffy. Um, they aren't really nice, thin, streamlined um, creatures like, a, say, a mayfly is or even a stonefly. They're, uh, they're pretty straggly, and especially the pupa um, tend to be quite kind of fat looking and have, um, have gas bubbles that form around them that actually help propel them to the surface when they're hatching. Um, and, uh, and to sort of imitate that look, what you can do is create a, a bulkier body and then kind of pick it out a little bit, give us some scruff um, to create that, that enlarged, bloated kind of look. So don't be afraid to dub it on kind of loosely. Here, you don't need a perfectly tight dubbing noodle as you'd want on, say, a mayfly dry fly or something. Be a little loose, be a little fat with this. And as you work your way up, you can sort of taper off this body. So you see, as I'm wrapping up here, I'm overlapping my wrap slightly. So it starts off you know, a little thinner toward the back. And then as I get up toward the front here, I'm just ramping that up a little bit. Not by a ton, but just, just enough to be noticeable. Just a touch more here toward the front. Again, it doesn't need to be tight. You can be a little loose with this. You'll notice I'm leaving, again, about two, three millimeters of space just at the head here. I'm going to go for my pearl tinsel now, and we're going to start winding this through the body. And so what I like to do, you can just evenly space your wraps, or you can make them just a little tighter toward the back, a little closer together, and then gradually as you go forward, just very slightly space out your wraps a little more to give the impression of um, a natural taper in the segmentation of the bug. Not absolutely necessary, but it's a nice touch. I'll just cross my thread off here, tie that tinsel off, trim away the excess. There we go. And even that, frankly, you could fish the fly as is that I'm sure would catch. A uh, nice little addition to this fly though. Not really an addition, it is part of the original pattern, it is a partridge hackle at the front here as well. So I'm just doing the same thing as I did on the last one, I'm doing it off screen here. Just picking a hackle, sort of a, a medium size this time. Sure, that looks good. So I'll prep it the same way, just I'm going to pull off all this fluff from the side here. Like so. And I'm just going to grasp as close to the tip of the feather as I can and just pull down, not stripping off, but just drawing down the fibers from the tip to expose this little tip section. That's where we're going to tie it in from. Now with these feathers, you'll notice as with any hackle, they have a natural curvature to them. And so to take advantage of that and how this feather is going to wrap, if you can see this feather is curved toward one side. When I tie this in, I want it to hug turn down towards the body. I don't want it kicking up like this, I want it curving down with the hook. And that's just going to properly align this hackle so when we start wrapping it, it's going to have a nice sort of streamlined look to it. So I've caught that in by the tip. I like to fold the tip here, just this little part in front back and tie it down again for some extra security. And it wouldn't be noticeable if you left it in, but I'll just trim away the tip now. Grab her hackle, and as I wrap this, what I want to do is just pull these fibers back into the fly and make 
This, this size hook, you'll only be able to make about one full wrap, maybe one and a half. I don't mind, again, it being sort of a bushy, buggy fly, so I'll do as much as I can on there. Tie that off, and again, trim away the excess. And the nice thing about partridge hackle, if you don't have partridge, you could do this with, say, a hen hackle or something like that. But a partridge is just, it's got that nice barring, which is always great, because not much in nature is one color all throughout. Um, but it's also a very soft hackle. It is the traditional soft hackle. So if you're tying, say, sort of, um, you know, traditional spider patterns and wet flies, you'll see partridge called for very often because it's very soft, it's very mobile, uh, looks very lifelike in the water. But again, you could substitute this with any sort of soft hackle, even a, a CDC, if you wanted to take some, uh, some cutie canard and put it into like a, a dubbing loop or just dub it onto your thread and put it up here, that's a very nice soft uh, sort of hackle fiber as well that you could use. So I'm just gonna make sure it's tied in nice and tight. And then what you wanna do on the front here, you can use a couple of different things. The original used a peacock curl, just wound at the front here, a couple wraps. What I've got here, this is a nice other option for you if you want something just a little flashier, is uh, some ice dub. You could use different colors. This is a peacock black, so it's, it's got that peacock sort of iridescence, but a, a nice bold black color. And I'm just gonna take a small pinch of this Dub it onto my thread again, kind of on the loose side. I'm not looking to make anything really tight with this fly. And I'm just going to wind a little collar to cover up my thread wraps. And more importantly even than that is to offer some contrast in this fly. Um, one big thing I, I really like to see in flies is a point of contrast, whatever that may be, but a, a sudden color change like that. It just sort of breaks things up. In my mind, again, there's, there's not a lot in nature that's sort of one color all throughout. That's all olive. There's going to be a dark spot or a light spot in a fly somewhere. Um, you know, if you look at a piece of grass or a, a twig floating downstream, that um, you know is a lot of time more more than not uh, one color throughout. But a nymph typically has different colors going on. It's sort of broken, and so I think this is a nice little um, sort of hot spot in its own right here. Break things up, but also tidy the fly up overall. So I've got that on there. Again, I'll throw a whip finish on there. Like so. Trim off our thread. And again, you can put some head cement on there. Not absolutely necessary. It'll get picked out as you go. But what you can do to really accentuate the bugginess of this fly is if you take just a little Velcro, a little dubbing pick, and don't go too crazy with it, but just roughly pick out some of these fibers just to give it a little more fullness, a little more motion, translucency, and just overall life. You can see just how buggy that thing is, and you can sort of see the translucency come through the body here. Gives it just a really nice buggy kind of profile. So really good resident trout fly. I haven't fished it at the ponds, but I mean, you do get caddis coming off. I'm sure it would work. And uh, certainly a, a good steelhead fly, especially getting into the warmer months uh, as we are right now. So there you go, Anderson's bird of prey. We are motoring right along here, so I'll see if I can talk a little slower on the last one. The last one's going to be uh, a fly of my own creation, actually. This is, I don't really have a name for it, but it's just a stone fly pattern. It's a fun little fly. I'll show you what it's kind of going to look like. We're actually going to do a more, slightly more intricate version here, but this is it here. It's just a good all-purpose cast stone fly. Uh, this is tied on a really heavy wire hook. You don't necessarily have to tie it on a heavy wire, but for steelhead, you might as well. I don't, I don't see any reason why not. So we'll pop that out. The hook here, we're going to tie a slightly smaller one than what I had shown there, because this is more, again, what you're going to fish this time of year. This is a Daiichi 2151. It's actually a salmon hook. Um, it's meant for just sort of heavy, traditional salmon wet flies. But I th actually think it works quite well for, for large nymphs. I don't see any reason why not to use it. You could definitely use just a, a curved sort of nymph hook if you wanted to, though. So this is a size 8. You can tie stoneflies very big. We get stoneflies naturally up to, you know, 3 inches. Uh, maybe that's a little much, but 2, 2 and a half inches um, locally. And so, yeah, you can go big on these things, and they will absolutely work. Uh, but this is probably more typical of the size that you'll fish around here. What I like to do is get a little bit of weight in there, but more importantly even than adding the weight is to create some profile. So again, I'll just use a little bit of 025 lead wire or lead free. 
and I'm not going to go crazy, but I'm just going to make a few wraps sort of on the front. I don't know. If you imagine you divide the fly into thirds, in the middle third. And then again, I'll just break off our tag ends. You could tie this, I've tied some variations of this fly with a bead head as well, you certainly could do that. I think it looks a little better with just uh, without. Uh, for thread, same thread that we used in the last one, so just a brown thread, something to sort of match the body color. We're going to tie a black fly here, but the brown thread's not going to make a huge difference. I like to start my thread in front of the wire and then just sort of hop right over the wire with a couple of wide turns. A few wraps behind to lock it in and then back forward over the wire here. Just so it doesn't move around, I'll just go over it a couple times, like so, lock it in place. And we can break off the excess thread there. So same thing that we did on the other flies there, I'm just going to again to build up just a little taper off the back here, smooth things out for us. It's going to help in building the profile of the fly, but also just for ease of tying, makes things a little simpler. So we'll take our wraps back. I'm not going to go crazy far back on this hook, you know, again, back to in around the barb or so. And what I really like to use for this, you could use rubber legs, but this is um, a uniflex, similar to a product called Spanflex. If anyone's tied an apps worm before, great still water fly, same material. This is a black. You could tie this in browns, olives, anything you like. And so yeah, it's a spandex kind of material. It's a very, very thin leg material, so really great for small flies, but a rubber leg would absolutely work. So I've taken a length, you know, a few inches long here, and what I do is I just double it over my thread. Like so. So I've got doubled over, and then from there I'll just tie it down, bring my thread down, and tie it down right on top of the hook. You can pull it back a little, make placing it a little easier. And then I've got my two tail fibers coming off there. I can trim those now if you want. I like a stonefly with longer legs than shorter. Uh, my focus here is not to make a super imitative um, exact replica of a stonefly, but rather suggest life. And stoneflies are big and they present a huge potential calorie intake for a fish and, um, and legs can add a ton of movement and vibration to a fly uh, that I think again does nothing but good things and suggest and suggesting a life for you. So longer rather than shorter basically is all I'm trying to say here. I would go in around hook shank length. Again, stonefly tails, if you look at them, aren't that long. But for this fly and for really most stoneflies, I like a good long tail and long legs on it. All right, so that's our tail. We're going to, before advancing, actually take another length of the same stuff there. Just that. So span flex, uni flex material. About the same length, I'm just going to tie that in right off the back. Just like we tied in the tinsel on the last fly. There we go. That's going to be the rib of this fly. Now for the body, I just like a rabbit dummy. You could use anything you want. This is a really old pack, but uh, just a rabbit dubbing or some other not so flashy dubbing, ideally. Again, mix up the colors. Black is probably my favorite color for a stonefly. But sort of golden olives and browns can be really, really good too. Dubbing this on, again, it doesn't need to be super tight. But I am looking to build a little taper. If you want, you can build that taper straight into your dubbing noodle by just dubbing less onto the top and more down on the bottom. Or we can build it up with overlapping turns as we go forward. Taking this back to our tail here. Just start wrapping forwards. And again, as I go forwards, you can see I'm just overlapping my turns a little bit more with each consecutive turn. As we get up to the wire, I'm going to go a little further forward than that. Not looking to take this all the way up. And you can see that wire actually aids in building that nice taper as well, that nice serve cone shape on the back. The wire ramps it up nicely for us. Looking at that, I'm just going to put on a tiny, tiny bit more. Spacing's kind of to your eye here, but going just a hair past the halfway mark, I find is about right. Now this longer length of uniflex that we tied off the back, I'm going to take, I'm going to rib the fly with it. 
And this doesn't really add any flash or anything, but it just gives us a nice sense of segmentation. So similar to the last fly, I'm just making tighter wraps at the back and then with each wrap, spacing things out a little bit more. Just to give it a nice sense of segmentation there. That probably doesn't matter one bit, but I like the way it looks. And that's what counts. So we've got that, that's our rear half of the body. Now for the wing case on this fly, you can use different stuff. You can use, you could use tinsel if you wanted to, if you want something flashier, you could use um, say um, like a braid material. You could use turkey, you could use uh, Swiss straw, whatever. I've just got some pheasant tail. I tend to have a lot of pheasant tail lying around my bench. So that's what I'm using here. All I'm going to do is rip off a nice big chunk of pheasant tail like that. Okay, I'm gonna take that, tie it back just off the top here. So I'm just trying to center that right on the top. I don't care how long that is, just tying it in. In fact, longer is better off the back here. And then I'll just trim off all the waste up front, all these curlies. Like so. Now for the thorax, um, we're going to incorporate, uh, actually, I'm sorry, again, getting ahead of myself. It's been a while since I've tied these things. Um, back to our favorite Uniflex here. I'm going to take two lengths. I have some leftover from the last step, so I'm going to take that one first. I'm going to tie it in just on the side of the fly with a good amount of overhang in either direction. So there we go. Bunch facing back, bunch facing forward. This stuff does sort of have a natural curve, so if you really want to get into it, you can actually turn this stuff and tie it in so it sort of hugs the body, which is kind of a cool looking look. I can assure you with certainty that does not affect how it fishes, but it, it looks cool. And we'll do the same thing on the other side. Just my near side here. Like so, so that doesn't really stick out too much. You can't really see it, but again, same thing. I've just got two pieces on this side. So we've got sort of an X pattern going with our span flex. And then for some additional motion, an additional profile, I do like to incorporate again, actually a partridge hackle. Or you could use a hen hackle or anything else. Um, again, I'm going to go for one of these sort of darker hackles toward the back here. Something again, sort of decent sized. Mm, actually, you know what? On the black, I think I am going to go with the hackle now. I think that changed my mind. It's going to look a little better. Fun one here. Do, do, do. Maybe if I can find my black hen. Or not, we'll just stick with the original here. We'll go with the original plan. So what happens when you have two main materials? All right, so. Trouble is just finding one long enough. I want something you'll see why I mean in a second. The hen is a little easier to find the right length of feather. But basically I just, I don't care so much about the fiber length. Again, I think longer is better, if anything, when it comes to these things. But I need enough stem that I can wrap this front section here with a couple of turns. And as you saw on that last fly, these things get eaten up pretty quickly. So we've got our partridge. We're going to prep that in the same way as the last. So just pulling those fibers down from the tip. Tie it down so it hugs the hook. You can fold that tip back if you want it to be secured a little tighter. I'll acknowledge this fly is a little over the top, but if you like tying and want a fun fly to tie, it's a fun one. All right. Now for the rest of the thorax, I'm going to take some more of that black rabbit stubbing. And the fly does get to be a little messy at this point just because we've got so much going on. But it'll get simpler once we finish this step. So I've got some more rabbit dubbing on there. You could change up the color if you want a, a two color kind of effect here. All I want to do is cover up the entire thorax with dubbing. 
just be careful at this point. Um, I find it's a bad habit of mine. I will sometimes leave thread gaps behind this where I've tied in all those materials. And that gets a little annoying when you finish up the fly and there's this weird either thread gap or just thin spot. So if anything, take a wrap back over those materials, take a look, make sure nothing's exposed. So we've got that thorax coming together. Now I'm gonna take my hackle here. And again, just sort of sweeping back these fibers as I wrap. Just try and put on a good full sort of turn and a half here. So we're just spiraling loosely through that body there up to the head. If anything, I'd rather have more hackle toward the front than the back because this is going to sweep over the whole fly and really create the profile of the fly. So if that means making a really wide wrap, that's fine. Catch that in back here. Trim off the waist. And now we're going to address our pheasant tail on the top here, our wing case. What I'm going to do is take my fingers and just pull down roughly that hackle out of the way. And at the same time, I'm gonna grab my pheasant tail here at the top, pull it back over. Again, try and clear out any hackles that might be caught up in that. Like so. And then just catch that in, tie it down. Just trim off that excess there. And now these two legs hanging forward, I'm going to pull back one at a time along the sides of the fly. One, and just tie back, two, and then any other sort of loose straggler fibers up here like that, I'll just pull back as well. And put a few wraps over top of to hold back. And then I'm going to whip finish and there is still some more work to be done on this fly, so don't worry, we're not there yet. It does look a little messy still. Going to then trim my legs here at the front. So in terms of length, um, you know, I would say back to roughly the end of the body is about where I like them. Like so. And then sort of pushing this hackle down, sweeping it back. I'll we'll see what this is going to shape up like here. So you saw what the fly looked like without hackle. The hackle just adds, you know, again, a little bit more body to the fly, a little bit more motion, a little more life. It's kind of what we're looking at there. It's got this nice windswept look. And what I like to do just for durability's sake more than anything else is I'll take a little bit more of my UV resin here. And I'm just going to create a little bit of a wing case using the resin, so. Take a decent sized draw. Again, clear out as many hackles as you can. And I'm just putting it only on top of the pheasant tail here. And that's just because fish's teeth tend to get wrapped up in this pheasant tail and they can break it pretty easily. Start plucking feathers out or fibers out. So this makes for a little bit of a more durable fly in the end here. Hit that with our light. This battery's dying on me. It's all right. And if there's one change I'd make to this fly, this hackle might be a little long, a little dense for this size hook. It would have been better on a, a larger hook here. So this fly definitely, I'd say, if you had some hen lying around, it might be the better bet. But that's going to fish just fine for us. It's got lots of body, lots of profile. It's the key with stone flies is you want to make them pretty big. If you look at them, they're, they're not small bugs. Uh, they're quite noticeable drifting down a river, so don't be afraid to tie these things a little bigger. Those long legs, long hackles, you know, get them moving. Make sure the fish see them, and when they do, they, uh, they want them more often than not. And so that kind of caps off what I had planned for you guys. That's, uh, that's four flies, that's your egg fly, your worm, your uh, caddis, and your stone fly. And between those, I really do think, you know, if you tie them in a few different sizes, a few different colors, that really covers your base as well, no matter where you're fishing uh, in the world, frankly, not just Ontario. But um, if you're you know, off in BC or whatever, any season, any river, any time, few sizes, few colors, and you've got yourself a really good steelhead nymph box or trout nymph box or a box for the club. If, uh, if you guys do have any questions about that in the coming hours, weeks, 
months. <laughs> Feel free to uh, get a hold of me through the club. Happy to always help out with any sort of fishing or tying questions, or you can reach me at the shop at Drift Outfitters. And uh, yeah, we'll chat with you guys soon. Have a good night.